and children will go to children's church. As we now turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, we have finally made it to the last lap um, of this book. And uh, as we look at this uh, last chapter, we, we are drawn to one attribute and one foundational component and commodity that you and I need uh, for everything. And it is love. Love is what our eyes are drawn to as we look at this passage and we look at this verse this morning. Hebrews chapter 13. And it says there very briefly, let brotherly love continue. And I think that's where we will stop for the day. We will not be able to go further than that. But if we had to go further than that, I will show you a couple of things to, so that you can see where we're going. This right here is love one another. Okay? That's what we see in verse 1. Verse 2 says, do not neglect to show hospitality for by doing this some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Okay? So you have loved one another and now you have loved strangers. Okay? Love for strangers. Hospitality. Right? Look at verse 3. Remember the prisoners as though you were in prison with them and the mistreated as though you yourselves were suffering body. Again, you remember them how? In love. Okay? This is, this is the theme here. Love. Love one another. Love for strangers. Now, love for the destitute. Okay? Those who are uh, sidelined, abused, beaten, bruised, the destitute. Love them as well. Remember them. Do acts of love for them. And then verse 4, marriage must be respected by all. And the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge immoral people and adulteresses. Again there, love your spouse. Love one another. Love stranger. Love destitute. Love your spouse. Okay? Um, verse 5, your life should be free from the love of money. There you go. Do not love money. Okay, you see love? Again, coming up there. Uh, uh, it says, be satisfied with what you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Okay, that's what you see there. Um, do not love money, but love God. Okay, love God. Love God. God is faithful. Love God. Be satisfied in God. Okay, let your satisfaction flow from God. Alright, that's what we see there. Verse 7, remember your leaders, love your leaders. Okay, that means me uh, as well, okay. Love your leaders. Uh, is something that comes out there. Remember your leaders who have spoken God's word to you. As you can to observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Again, uh, that one, verse 8, I tie it with verse 9. It says, Don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teachings, for it is good for your, for the heart to be established by grace and not by foods since those involved 
in them have not been defeated. So, love doctrine, love the teachings, love the word of God, love the faithfulness of God. Um, and then he, 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 he talks about in verse, uh, verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve uh, the tabernacle do not have the right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. And then he points out something there. And then he's saying there, love worship. Okay, he brings worship into the picture. Uh, love worship. Love coming to the house of the Lord. And then he points us to Christ. And he says, therefore Jesus also suffered outside the gate, so that he might sanctify people with his own blood. Verse 13, let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. Let us go there. Let us love Jesus. Let us love the cross. Outside the camp is the crucifixion of Jesus. Let us love the cross of Jesus Christ. Let us not be ashamed of the message of the cross. Let us love it. Love the cross. Love the cross. Love the cross. Uh, let me just stop there and not uh, keep going. I think you see a trend there. You see some uh, love being pushed uh, in various ways. But the foundation begins in verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. Now, of course the context is interesting uh, as well here. Of course, the writer of Hebrews, uh, as, as many people uh, uh, would say or not say, um, that's like Paul. It's, it's almost like uh, this is a Pauline letter. Uh, just didn't want to say Paul uh, when he starts the. He, he doesn't follow the traditional route, but the structure is pretty much the same. When you see all the Pauline letters, you will see that he begins with the theology, and then he brings the practice. And you see that in this book as well. He's been demonstrating all kinds of the superiority of Christ uh, in, the, in, in everything of the Old Covenant. Now he comes here and he says, okay, let us have love for one another. It's almost like chapter 13 is the praxis of the whole thing. You've had the theory from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 12. Now, this is what you must do. Do this, do this, do this. Do this, do this, do this. Now that you have this, do this. Now that you know these things, this is how you must practice them. This is how they must overflow from you. And you see it in all of Paul's letters. He demonstrated. You look at Romans. Romans chapter 1 to chapter 11. All theology. All doctrine. He begins by the gospel. And he defines the gospel and he uh, talks about a uh, general revelation of God and he talks about how everybody has fallen and they're all not seeking God and everybody is lost, both Jews and Gentiles. That's chapter 3 and then he points out how in Christ we have brought near and then he points out the relationship between faith and works. Abraham by faith in chapter 4. In chapter 5, he starts talking about how we are free in Christ, the benefit of being in Christ, and that Christ loved us and has removed the enmity. And then he points out, out this grace that we have. And then he points in chapter 6, sin. And he says, just because there is sin, should we now continue in, uh, in sin? Because when sin abounds, grace abounds more, and it's certainly not. And he points out the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And then he points out, chapter 8, there is now no condemnation of them that are in Christ. And he points out the in Christ, and he goes all the way to show you what we have in Christ. 
and how everything will be reconciled in Christ. Then you get to chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, Israel, election, sovereignty, points out these things. And then when he gets to chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, I urge you, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Do not be conformed according to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Let everybody serve. And then he explains some of the spiritual gifts. Do this, do this, do this, and he goes on. You see, from chapter 1 to chapter 11, theology. Chapter 12 to 16, praxis. Doctrine and duty is what we see. You see it as well in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world in love. He predestined us to be adopted as sons. And he goes on and explains that. And then he does a prayer. And then chapter 2, he shows you what you were and what you are in Christ. And points out how God has brought together in Christ those who were of circumcision and those who were not of circumcision. He brings them together. Chapter 3, he talks about the purposes of the church that God called us to these things and, and then there's a prayer there and then he concludes there but then in chapter 4 because there's only 6 chapters half of the book is doctrine chapter 4 he says therefore walk worthy of your calling He's, this is what he does he points out these things now that you and I have spent so much time looking at the book of Hebrews and looking at the first 12 chapters, we come here and we're told, let brotherly love continue. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to focus on this thing. And now, uh, the, you see, doctrine directs us, guides us, uh, uh, gives us a clear path to follow and it is always first God what and then man what okay it's first vertical and then horizontal it is always like that it always follows that pattern brotherly love exists because of God's love the scripture is also very clear about these things. Love the Lord your God first. And then love your neighbor as yourself. It always follows this particular pattern. Now that you have a God that you must serve, when you're serving this God, you will serve your fellow brothers in the Lord your fellow children of God. It is also interesting uh, when you look at these things and you look at how this was firstly, it's been pointing to our relation with God and now it points to our relation with one another. It's been uh, chapter 12 verse 25, make sure that you do not reject him but you hear him who speaks uh, there. It talks about our relation with God. Love is always relational. When, 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 when love is not relational, it's not love. Love has everything to do with the relation. It is relational. It is caring for one another. It is always towards something. There is not just love uh, on its own. Love is always towards something. It's always in the relation to something. And, and he points that out to say, uh, listen to him. He's been always been focused uh, to God. And even in verse 28, it says, uh, let us serve him so that we may serve him uh, acceptably so. It's been pointing Godward. And now, from there, he's pointing to us, to one another. Brotherly love is an interesting concept today. 
this kind of love. He first, the first thing I want you to see is he says, let it continue. It exists. It is there. It must just continue. It must be kept. It must be maintained. The love for the brethren is to be kept, is to continue, is to not cease. It must never uh, pause. It must always continue. It must always continue. In fact, isn't it love is actually a fruit of the Spirit, right? Galatians 5, verse 22. For the, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So as a child of God, the one who is in a relation with God, the one who is connected to God, the one who is always been Godward, when you are Godward, there is something that is inside of you that is uh, produced by the Spirit of God that is in you and it's love. That's the first thing. Love. That love. Brotherly love. Continue. It is also interesting in, 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 in Galatians uh, 2, not, not 2, Galatians 5. Um, in verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. Uh, something very interesting there, pointing out love as well, that even faith works in love or through love. Notice there the spirit of faith, okay? It, it, it has been said that uh, the spirit of Christianity is the spirit of love. I think it was Matthew Henry who said that the spirit of Christianity is the spirit of love. And now here in Galatians 5, 5 and 6, he says, For through the spirit, by faith, we can wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. Okay? Even the faith itself works through love. It is love that uh, makes faith acceptable. Faith is not acceptable without love. Faith works through love. It is this labor of love that comes out, uh, your, 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 your labor of love that comes out uh, in brother way. In fact, the scripture also says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, uh, which I want, I want to, to highlight here, it says, everyone who believes, again, that's faith, right? Everyone who believes, first John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. You see that God what manifests man what everyone who actually believes if you are sitting here today and you believe that Jesus is the Messiah you believe it with all your heart right that is the result that is the work of God inside the soul of a man. That you be sitting here believing that Jesus is the Messiah. That is the work of God. It says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, notice the tense, has 
been born of God. Okay. I know we've done this before. It doesn't harm us to do it again. The birth to be born of God precedes, comes before your belief. The one who believes, present tense, here you are, believe, you believe because you were born of God. That's why you believe. You see, when we see it, you and I, especially me as the preacher, I'll be standing here, I'll be preaching the gospel, I'll be proclaiming, and then I say, uh, those who believe, let me pray with you. Those who believe this message, let me pray with you. And you rise up because you believe it. It is the work of God inside your soul that has caused you to believe it. It is the work of the Holy Spirit inside your soul that has given you the regeneration, that has given you the new birth. The new birth is not going to happen because I prayed. The new birth has happened and therefore you stand and say, I believe. Because Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. So you need to be born first before you can believe. It is a crazy thing that we have developed over the years to think that a dead person can respond without being born first. It's a crazy thing. We have attributed the gospel to uh, men so much that even when it doesn't even make sense that a dead person can actually believe. Two weeks ago, or maybe three, we were sitting there in our Bible study and I asked a question and I said, what can a dead man do? And my son Micah answered and he said, nothing. A dead man can do nothing. And that is what brings about the birth. And the illustration is very powerful of Jesus standing at the tomb and calling Lazarus forth. And when he stood there, Lazarus was dead. Lazarus was stinking. He had been dead for four days. He was already in the tomb. Just that back then they were not burying like us. If it was like us, he would have been buried with dirt on his chest already. That's what we do. Back then they would put you in a cave, just mummify him and put a lot of cloth around him and spices and all that. And in there, there he was. When Jesus called him and said, Lazarus, come forth. The power of God goes into Lazarus, raises him from the dead so that Lazarus can come forth. And because he's also mummified, he can't just walk out. They have to open the tomb and he just comes out. I believe he was dragged out by the power of God. Or maybe still in suspense and a miracle was happening because he's dead. And Jesus said, lose him. He came forth. He came out. But the power of God is what goes in there, makes him alive. The rotten tissue of his body, renewed by that power of God. That's exactly what happens to us in salvation. When God calls you and brings you into his saving knowledge, the power of God goes inside of us, resuscitates us, overcomes us, and gives us that willingness and the volition to actually believe and follow God. Because without the power of God, the Bible is very clear to say, they do not come to the light. 
they hate the light. They will not come to the light. But the power of God has to overcome us and then we come to the light. But when that happens, when that happens, this verse says here, and everyone who loves the Father must be able to love those who are born of him. Now all of a sudden, you all have one thing in common. The same DNA inside each and every one of us. The divine seed of God that has been planted inside your soul. Even though we may be from different places and different backgrounds and different cultures and different languages, but we are able to become a family and dwell together because we have one thing in common and it is the seed of God that is inside of us. And therefore, loving one another becomes a common thing that we do because when I see you, I see a child of God just as I am a child of God. Let me show you some drastic changes that happens. Look at Acts chapter 16. Look at Acts 16 verse 33. You remember Paul and Silas praying and praising God in jail, in the Philippian jail. And while they were there, a miracle happened and all those things. Look at verse 33. That midnight deliverance. Look at verse 33. Acts chapter 16, 33. And it says, He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away. He and all his family were baptized. This guy, the Philippian jailer, was there as a prison guard or in warden. Seems like he had some, some powers. Being the ones who are inflicting pain to Paul and Silas, being the ones, uh, prison was not nice, I mean prison is not nice, uh, maybe, maybe in South Africa and, uh, it's, it's, it's mild, it's okay, <laughs> but, but prison is not nice, and so the prisoner, the jailer, were one of, some of the most unkind people, let me put it that way, unkind people. They were not kind to Paul and Silas. But something happened in the midnight. Something happened to this guy who is now transformed. He takes Paul and Silas and is washing them All of a sudden, these people have just become his own brothers in the Lord. Let brotherly love continue. They have just become brothers and he changes immediately. Immediately he changes. He treats them with care and with love immediately. That is an act of a person who has been regenerated immediately. Let me show you another example. I'll, 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 I'll paint a picture for you. Here's Jesus on the cross. Besides him are two notorious killers, evil people who love tormenting other people. Even in death, they are like that. Both of them are like that. They have been sentenced to death. 
by the Roman government because these people are evil. And here they are, Jesus in the middle, the three of them are being crucified. You have this other one taunting Jesus, even in death, he still is himself. There is another one. Something has happened to him. Something supernatural has happened to him. He starts going against his fellow criminal, so to speak. He starts saying to him, you shut up. St stop it. Stop it. He has done nothing wrong. I'm sure the other criminal is looks at him like, dude, <laughs> throw me under the bus here. What happened to you? What's up? We were together. Something supernatural has happened to this guy. He is now standing for his older brother, Jesus, right there. He has been changed. He has been transformed. He has experienced something he has never seen. And he even prays and prays to Jesus and says, Remember me when you come in the kingdom. And Jesus assures him and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. Because something supernatural has happened to him. What am I saying today? I'm saying to you today, if the life of God has happened in your heart, brotherly love will continue. Brotherly love will be the evidence. And if the love of God has not happened to you, then we are clear. No love, no Christ. No love, no Christianity. No love, we're not brothers. We're not brothers. Brotherly love is what continues. Let me demonstrate this to you as well here. Um, hopefully I'll find my, my, my notes quickly here. Turn, turn with me to uh, chapter 2 of Hebrews. Chapter 2 of Hebrews. So that you see um, how Jesus is the older brother. Look at verse 10. Chapter 2 of Hebrews. Verse 10. Brotherly love. He says there, the writer of Hebrews, for in bringing many sons to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, all things exist for him and through him, should make the source of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Verse 12, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. You see that? Jesus, the one who sanctifies us, the ones who are being sanctified, we have one Father. God, the Father, is our Father. And that is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Let brotherly love 
continue. He has already highlighted this issue of brother for us in chapter 2 here. And Jesus is not ashamed. And in fact, it is precisely why Jesus had to have a body and become one of us. Because the Bible says he does not come to help angels, but to help the offsprings of Abraham. That's why we are brothers together with Christ. And therefore, everyone who believes in God and believes that Jesus is the Messiah, that person has been born of God and therefore is a child of God. And because they are born of God, they are a child of God, you ought to love them. Love. Love. Love is a commodity you and I cannot do without. Let me close with this verse and we will continue on this on this, uh, on this uh, uh, love study as we continue. Second Peter chapter 1. I want to read verse 5 to 8. But I want you to see that the last thing he adds on is love. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 8. No, verse 5 to 8. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 5. Second Peter 1 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness. Goodness with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with endurance. Endurance with godliness. Godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these things are yours, they will make you fruitful brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. He concludes it with love. Love is the beginning and the end of these things. Love is that commodity that remains. Love is that commodity that begins. He asked you to add these things, make every effort that you exercise these things. And um, maybe next week, uh, when we look at these things, we will be able to bring some more practical ways in which love should be evidenced and seen and supported and harnessed among the fellow children of God. Love. Love is what we need. Amen. Let's close in this benediction. I pray that God may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power in the inner man through his spirit and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you be rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love. And to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.